Monday evening, August 12, 2019. We are at the Board of Education uh, building at 35353 Curtis Boulevard. Mr. Parkinson, will you call the roll? Dr. Beal? Here. Mr. Jones? Here. Mrs. Pajinski? Here. Mrs. Brown? Here. Mrs. Hart? Here. Thank you, Mr. Parkinson. Will you join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? Temporary occupancy um, permit means staff can go in, we can, we can start. That means all the safety, uh, health and safety uh, items are in place, fire suppression, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that is not the case um, at North High School at this, at this juncture. So we wait each day. Obviously, teachers report tomorrow, teacher and staff report tomorrow. Some staff is already reported as of the first. Um, teachers and administrative staff are in Longfellow and have been in Longfellow since Wednesday. Um, staff is now in South High School as well. Staff and teachers are in South High School. But North High School, so teacher supplies remain in Connex boxes, building materials, et cetera, et cetera until we can get a, at least a temporary occupancy permit, um, which, um, you know, as you all are aware, um, we've been counseled that it'll come, it's, it's tomorrow, 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 and, uh, to the you know, receipt. So, um, you know, for North High School, the South was just one. temporary, 
So is the permit that they have a temporary one, or is it the full, meaning everyone, teachers, students, everyone can, is allowed to come on the grounds, or is it just for staff? Um, is one of my main questions. So you know our policy is not to answer that, but that's a pretty easy answer, and I'll let Mr. Thompson finish that for you, and then um, I, I don't know what you checked on your box, but we'll follow up with okay. you. Just a quick response. The answer is it's temporary occupancy, which is for staff and um, teachers, for all staff. Uh, the last piece that's preventing uh, <coughs> full occupancy we're supposed to have in the morning, it was the last connecting drive that they're laying blacktop on right now. So it's, it has nothing to do with the inside of the building. That's 100%. Right. I mean, there's small items that need done, but I like touch-up paint, et cetera, et cetera. But, uh, the last piece is that connecting drive. And that will that was being poured this afternoon. And spoke and the inspectors are coming back out in the morning and I'm being told that you're talking the one in the middle. No, the one in the middle will not be done. We're gonna have it's the one on the far end that we you would normally come in. Right. That one. So the parents will come in there. Unfortunately the buses we're gonna have police there. The buses are gonna have to enter there and then they'll be off to the left. Parents will go straight. But once the main entrance is in place, then the buses will go in the main entrance. The parents will go where they went last year, previous years. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so I guess one of my concerns is right now it still looks like a construction site. Um, it still starts in two days. There's supposed to be a meet and greet tomorrow, and it still looks like a construction site. And that, that's a fear for me and for a lot of parents who have children, like maybe some of these parents have children who are walking to school with all this construction equipment around. Um, doesn't look very safe for our children? They're supposed to be all pulled off that site okay. by the end of tomorrow. By the end of tomorrow? Okay. And, and the reason for not closing it was the fear that it really puts parents in a difficult spot. It does. It does. And that's kind of why I think, I, I, from the parents that I've spoken to, one of the concerns was that if it was going to be pushed back, that it maybe could have been done when North and South were, so people had at least two weeks to kind of do it. Because, you know, now we're worrying about whether the teachers know where to go for safety reasons, if there's an emergency, or, um, you know, like I, one of my sons, my son who goes there, it has severe anxiety, and he is very nervous about starting at a new school, and not seeing a finished building isn't helping him. Um, so that, that's a concern um, that we have, so. Okay, thank you, Mrs. Hopkins. Mr. Ferguson, next speaker. Uh, Mr. Glenmore. Oh, that's me. Uh, I'm Moore, 36105, Shining Road, Willoughby Hills. I don't have any kids going to school there, but I have three that went through the South years ago. You people are controlling the schools, and uh, my kids went there. Schools were in the top 10%, 10%. 15% years ago. Now we're down to the 15, 50%. Why? Why are we taking a nosedive? You people are in control. Is it teachers or is it the administration here? Why are we taking a nosedive? Yeah, I want to know why we're taking a nosedive. Yeah. I, I would encourage you to watch the presentation that you're going to see if you hang out. Set a standard, keep the standard, bring the students up, don't let them fall. You brought in a group of people to make these teachers look at the lower level. We don't need lower level. We need to bring those kids up. We don't need to bring our kids down. We need to bring the standards up and keep that standard up. Every one of these kids has got an opportunity, and that opportunity has to be met and has to be kept up. Now, I know you were in the military. Military taught you to, to bring that, bring it down to the lower level. We don't need the lower level. Oh, yeah, they did. I was in the military, and they taught you how to bring that little guy and cooperate with that little guy. 
bring it up to the main level and keep it up to the main level. We don't need to have another Euclid Cleveland School system here. We want that upper level kids, and we want to keep it up to the upper level. And Margaret, you've been around here for a thousand years. Keep it up here. We want these kids up and keep them occupied here. Thank you. I'm sorry? Okay. Uh, I hope so. I am John B. Blagrave, living at 36419 Ridge Road, Willoughby, since 1976. Madam President, my comments and three questions relate to the July 25th five-year budget forecast, Exhibit A in the document you have. In accordance with board policy, and because of the detail of the questions, a response at the September board meeting will be appropriate. Let me begin. Considering line 1.010, titled General Property Real Estate, as I review Exhibit B, which you have, notes and assumptions for Exhibit A, bullet item 3 for line 1.010, Quote, all emergency levy renewals are assumed to renew at earliest comma, legal, etc., etc., and it continues with more detail. Exhibit B also lists the many levies by the district since 1987. To my untrained interpretation, either two or three levies are to expire during the five-year forecast and are not reflected in the out years of the five-year forecast. This seems inconsistent with Exhibit A assumptions. If you review Exhibit C, which you have, column 4, the amount revenue drop-off from the levy expiration are reflected on line 1.010. Question 1. Should the expiring levies in the out years be included in the budget forecast? Note, this has a dramatic impact upon the solvency of the system. Moving on, considering line 1.020 titled Tangible Personal Property Tax, Exhibit D, which you have, is a photocopy of a News Herald August 5th article regarding the August 6th continuing 4.77 mil levy. I quote a part of it. The district says once the TPP is completely phased out, Changes in state reimbursement will result in a loss of more than $8.2 million per year. Passage of the tax would raise around $8.3 million per year. Exhibit C, column 2, shows the forecast of line 1.020, increasing 10.3% for school year 2019. Also, for school year 2020, the TPP tax is shown to increase another 19.0%. The forecast out years does show the TPP dropping off, but still being $4.38 million in school year 2023. The assumption notes for this line only mention lost revenue associated with First Energy. John, your three minutes are up, so I will take this, these questions and get the answers to you by the next meeting, or you don't, you don't want them sooner? I'm sorry, I'm not sure I understand the question. Your three minutes are up, your time allotted for budget. If you were causing me to sit down after three minutes, I will sit down. Yes. Is and that what you were doing? Yes, and I want you to know that you handed this information to me, and we will get you the answers. Do you want them before the next meeting, John? At the beginning, you stated no. In accordance with board policy, because of the details of the questions, which I have not finished, a response at the September board meeting will be appropriate. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Okay, Madam
Dr. Beal. I move that we uh, accept the board minutes uh, from July 18th. Will you please call the roll? Mrs. Aaron? Yes. Mr. Jones? Yes. Dr. Beal? Yes. Mrs. Brzezinski? Yes. Yes, motion is carried. Thank you. It's now time for the treasurer's report, <coughs> Mr. Parkinson. Thank you, Madam President. Number of board, the first item for your consideration is the financial report. That information will be found under this today. Uh, that is for the financial period, uh, which closes uh, this year. The next item for your consideration is the first financial report. Clear on uh, July 31st, the information will be found in B. The first amendment appropriations for fiscal 20 can be found under item C. <coughs> item B is the first amendment certificate of estimated resources for the county governor's office that can be found in D. <coughs> item 3E are various purchase orders and blanket certificates for your consideration. Mr. Parkinson, will you call the roll? Mrs. Shelton? Yes. Mr. Jones? Yes. Dr. Beal? Stay. Mrs. Zara? Yes. And Mrs. Yes. The motion is carried. Mr. Parkinson? <coughs> Thank you, Madam President. Members of the board, the next item for your consideration is the uh, price and attachment. Item H for your consideration is the Western Reserve Area Agency and an agent contract. Uh, this has to do with the RCP format. Uh, that particular contract can be found on uh, item H for your consideration. Item I are advances of general funds. There are four for your consideration one to a state grant. for consideration of transfer of funds to the employee termination benefit fund. This is the amount of $50,000. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, item L for your consideration are gifts and donations. And there's one uh, gift, and that is from the Hospice of Western, Western Reserve. They donated $500 to our RCP program. Uh, item M for your consideration is the delicate equipment Budgets and for the new fiscal year, they are sold before we review the 
time for the superintendent's question and answers from the last board meeting. There were no questions brought to the board at the last meeting that have not been answered. Thank you. And now the superintendent reports. Thank you, Madam President. The first item for your consideration is our food service agreement uh, with Chartwells. is a resolution authorizing the sale of Washington Elementary School via public auction. Uh, we have rented that to two um, renters over the course of, well, since we closed it. Um, so we're down to one renter at this point. The county knew their program, which was uh, probably occupied the vast majority of the building. Uh, that program has moved out. So this doesn't mean that we're going to do it. It just simply gives us the option to um, see what the market may or may not bear in terms of selling the building. It's about six acres. Of course, it's landlocked in the residential neighborhood, which brings down the value values. It. We did have the property appraised a few years ago. It appraised at six hundred thousand uh, dollars. But as you know, uh, nothing. Things worth what someone's willing to pay. So uh, that's where we're at at this point. But we did want to have the option to explore uh, if it would be financially beneficial for the district. We would have that option. So that's why we see it on, uh, on, on the agenda for that sort of Thank you. You have heard the superintendent's recommendation. What is the board's pleasure? Madam President, item D for the board's consideration is a lease agreement termination with the city of did I, did I skip C? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Item C is the resolution of intent not to provide career technical education in grade seven and eight. Uh, that was a state mandate that came down. Um, I, schools are not providing that at this point. Gina, can you speak um, to that at all? Yes. The state does not require that we provide career technical education in grades 7 and 8, but they do require that we pass a resolution stating that if we are not offering those services. And in our district, we are only offering those at the high school level. So we've done this for, I believe they started this resolution process about three years ago. I think we've made, I'm confident, and at least in probably all of Northeast Ohio, but certainly in Lake County, the greatest investments into career technical education. Um, we have two state-of-the-art facilities. We're part of Excel Tech, and we hold about half the programs in the entire consortium of Hill and housed here in the East. Um, I happen to be a huge proponent of that. I don't think college is for everyone, but I do think everyone should have a skill set for the high school. So that is our uh, what we are dedicated to providing. Um, item D for your consideration. Oh, I'm sorry. So.
consideration is the lease agreement termination with the city of Willoughby for Browning Elementary. Um, as you all know, Browning has been housed at the city uh, senior center for several years. The building is old, but in excellent shape. Uh, we'll determine over the course of this year how to best utilize that space. Um, so at this point, we have determined administratively we have some ideas but we'll present those at a later date to the school board as we get in and have an opportunity to fully assess the building and determine how to best use that building or not. I think that's a possibility as well. Item E for your consideration is a novel recommendation for high school English language arts two uh, that is the immortal life of Arietta Wax and that has um, of our high school and the curriculum department. Item F for your consideration is a special services agreement. Um, we do these um, historically each year and therefore to service students with disabilities. And then finally, item G for your consideration is the personnel agenda. Uh, those, all those folks that appear on the agenda uh, are pending still pending full employment based on satisfactory records from the Bureau of Criminal Investigation and Identification, our Department of Education, and the Federal Bureau of Investigation. They will be vetted for these things. Thank you. Um, the next is policies. descriptions uh, that are required to be embedded. So, enjoy the meeting. Very interesting. Meeting notification. The next meeting of this Board of Education will occur on September 9th at 7 p.m. right here on the first floor of the Willoughby Eastlake Board of Education building located at 53353 Kirk's Boulevard. Looking for a motion to approve item eight, the consent calendar. I'm looking for a motion to approve item 8A, the adoption of the consent calendar. Is there a motion? Madam President. Mrs. Zern. I make the motion to approve item 8A, adoption of the consent calendar. Thank you, Mrs. Zern. Is there a second? Madam President, Thank you, Mrs. Jeffrey. It will be adopted without item 3.
has been moved and seconded that we approve item 3E, purchase orders and blanket certificates. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, Mr. Parkinson, will you call the roll? Mrs. Pajewski? Yes. Mr. Jones? Yes. Yes. services to our teachers and our principals anywhere from preschool all the way up through grade 12 plus post-secondary which is college so it's a humongous job that we have to be able to provide support but our job is to provide resources and support to help the principals and teachers do their job better so I'm going to share with you today some of the initiatives that we had in place last year and some of the progress that we're seeing and what our plans are for this year so last year, Mr. Thompson and the board had stressed that as part of our strategic plan, we were going to work on pacing guides and standards-based instruction, which someone had mentioned earlier. And so we did create some new pacing guides last year. We created some new benchmark common assessments. We provided professional development, and we worked on some parent and community engagement activities. So I'm going to talk about you about each of those here. So a pacing guide, if you don't know what a pacing guide is, so Several years ago, the state came out with new standards, and they are higher standards, academic standards, than what students and teachers had been used to in the past. And it used to be that teachers pretty much had the academic freedom to teach those standards throughout the year. But as those have increased, we found that it's really important to make sure that we're providing consistent instruction in every classroom across the district. So we created pacing guides, which basically takes all the standards, for example, that a third grade student needs to master throughout the year. And we divided that up by quarter. So it's manageable by the teacher and it builds. So those skills build from quarter to quarter to quarter so that by the end of the year, the students will have mastered those standards. So a pacing guide helps keep a teacher on track. It helps keep a grade level on track as well. So if a student goes to second grade at Royal View, and in the middle of the year, they have to transfer over to Thomas Jefferson, but that student is still getting the same instruction that he would require. And so we created pacing guides for um, 11 ELA classes, 13 math, 3 science, and 2 social studies last year. We started using those at the beginning of the year, and at the end of the year, we got teacher groups together in K-5 to make adjustments to the pacing. Because once you create it, sometimes you realize that certain standards take a little bit longer to teach than others. So we've adjusted the pacing guides and the benchmark assessments that I'm going to talk about in a little bit. Secondary, we're starting to do that in August and September. 
In terms of benchmark assessments, we started using a program called Illuminate, and Illuminate gives us an option to create <coughs> assessments online that are more air-like. So as we know, the students in grades three through eight plus high school students take end of course exams, and those tests are all online. So we created some common assessments that all the students in the district are taking based on the new higher level standards from the state so that they can practice with air-like questions before they take the air test at the end of the year. So last year we created quarterly benchmarks. So we created 67 content area tests in ELA, Math, Science, and Social Studies. And we also created 24 writing prompt assessments. So we recognize that the students need to be able to read well, but they need to be able to write really well to communicate on these tests. So we created writing prompts. And a little bit later, I'm going to show you the tremendous growth that students made in writing last year based on the fact that they are doing more writing in the classroom. So our department also provides professional development and service training, mostly for certified staff. That's our teachers and our principals in the district and um, other administrators. And we do provide some for some classified staff. But we offered 229 sessions of professional development last year for our staff. And those staff earned over 10,000 professional development hours. What you may not know is that any teacher or administrator who is licensed in the state of Ohio has to continually have professional development hours in order to renew their license every five years. And so the hours that we provide them help them work toward those license renewals. We're also really encouraging teachers to collaborate together. Um, it used to be teachers really worked in isolation. So if I were a second grade teacher, I could close my door and teach all by myself. Now we really encourage those teachers to get together, work on those pacing guides together, monitor instruction and assessments so that everybody is consistent across the district. And that's what collaborative hours are. We also try to support our schools who are constantly trying to find ways that they can engage their parents and the community in the work that they do in the schools. And so one of the things that we started a few years ago is Kids First Night. Kids First Night was designed for incoming kindergarten students with, and their parents. Because a lot of the research shows that students who have a strong literacy background, and that includes not only reading and writing, but also oral language, do better in school. So we bring together incoming kindergarten parents and their students we teach them some learning games that they can play over the summer to help their students have those readiness skills for when they start kindergarten. Also, we're working collaboratively with our preschool department that is under the Pupil Services Department, Ian Bowers and Camille Ritt. And so in the spring, we make sure that all those students have a book to take home during spring break to encourage them to read with their parents. And one of the really fun aspects of that is that we have our high school athletes and other high school students come down to the preschool and they actually <coughs> read to the students, give them their book to take home, and then they play with them. So it's great to have that intergenerational work going on. Something new for this year, we have a group of preschool and primary teachers. We did some literacy professional development with them and they got really excited about how they might be able to help parents. And so they are offering a parenting series called Read and Rise, and we're going to target this year our parents of our preschoolers, and we're going to help them learn how to help their students gain the skills, the reading skills that they need to start school. We also in our department are responsible for managing the students who participate in the College Credit Plus program. Every school district in the state of Ohio is required to allow students to earn college credit while they are still in high school. And so our students at North and South High School earned a total of 4,000 college credits last year, which was a savings of over $465,000 for their parents who didn't have to pay for that college tuition. We have students attending Lakeland Community College, Cleveland State, Tri-C, and Notre Dame. Starting the next school year, which is 2021, we now have, we have worked for the past year on getting our teachers credentialed through the University of Akron, and so our students will be able to take some classes from um, our teachers and get credit through the University of Akron starting next year. 
We also manage out of our department federal grants. Um, Iron Bowers with People Services also manages some federal grants. We manage Title I, which is um, basically used for reading instruction in the buildings. Title II is professional development. We receive funds to support our English language learners. Um, Title IV-A is grant for mental health services and student academic success, and also we get some McKinney Vento homeless money. But the Ohio Department of Education does audit reviews of our federal grant programs. And so in the past six years, they have done four audits of our federal grants. And one was an on-site where they actually come and meet with us and they pull records and look at them. And then they've done three desk reviews, which they give us a list of documentation that we have to have. And we also work with the Treasury Department. And I'm just happy to say that we have had um, complete compliance on all four of those reviews through the Ohio Department of Education. So now we're going to talk a little bit about assessments and data. So all that work that we're doing isn't making a difference. So there are 74 plus tests that our department is responsible for making sure that we administer in the district. That includes not only the air assessments, but it also includes the KRA, MAP testing, um, AP testing, ACT, ACT testing for high school. So all of that we coordinate out of our department. And so the local report card, when it comes out from the state, tells us how we're doing in some of those areas. So we're going to talk first about the academic indicators. So on the report card, you have to have 80% proficient, and we're working really hard to get there. Now that we have those new standards, we have new pacing guides, and we have really more rigorous instruction in our classroom. So we're working to improve in all of those areas, and we did make improvement in 12 areas this year. And 10 of those areas were in the 70% plus range, so we're getting very close to that 80% indicator mark that we need on the local report card. Historically, that cutoff was what? It was 75. They increased it when they increased the standards, so everyone's having to jump up to later of their work. What happened to cut scores? Um, the cut scores increased greatly. Did so other we had some challenges. Did that uh, academic declines on state report cards? Yes. That's been a problem course. across the state, and I understand that a lot of people have been talking with their legislators about that. So we're still trying hard, though, because we know this is the bar that the state has set, and we're planning to meet that bar. So I'm really pleased that based on the new pacing guides and the instruction in the classroom, we're starting to see some improvement based on those 12 areas there. Also, I was really excited about writing. So I visit classrooms across the district on a regular basis, and we noticed that we really needed to have the students writing more. So we implemented those writing, quarterly writing prompts last year. And as you can see, we made some great, great gains, especially in elementary at third grade. So there isn't a separate writing test on air. It's part of the English language arts test, but we can disaggregate the writing standards out of that. So our third graders on the writing standards in 2018 were at 62% at or above the standard, and last year they jumped to 84. Fourth grade jumped from 79 to 91. Fifth grade from 76 to 88. So you can see on there that we made some really great gains in writing. And um, we did some professional development called Writing Across the Curriculum with our teachers the past couple of years, and we're going to continue that this year. But I'm really proud of that, and I think all of our teachers are really proud of that work that they did. Um, the other benefit of that is as our students write more in high school, they're going to do even better on their college entrances. Now I'm going to um, ask Eileen Bowers. Our departments work very closely together, and she really did a lot of work crunching some data, and she's going to talk with you about the gap closing data. Hi. The gap closing data is um, kind of probably the most complicated part of our report card, but basically, in a nutshell, the state has identified 10 subgroups across the state that they say meet our, our vulnerable set of sub subgroup population of children and need some targeted attention. Um, though there are 10 of them, our most highly populated out of those 10 are the four that are on the screen right here. That We have the most amount of children in those four 
of the named 10 subgroups. So those were the four that we targeted. What they're trying to do, they acknowledge that some of these children are not on grade level, they are not meeting the standard where they need to be, but they want to make sure that we're closing the gap, that, that we're beginning to gain, that they are beginning to gain growth. The goal across the state is that by 2025, they will be, the gap will be closed, and they will be as close to grade level as we can get, and that's, that's where we're headed. So they've been measuring this for years now, and what they're looking at is the progress on ELA and, and math in the air test. So there's two ways for a district to get points when a child is identified in one of these gaps. One is just simply meeting the state goal. So you can see in ELA, for that first group there, um, black non-Hispanic. So the, the performance indicator that we reached in the state was 71 point, or that's 73 point points. Thank you. <laughs> and the state goal was 65. So that's kind of how you read the chart. So we just met the state goal on all four, and then we got 100 points. And as a report card for all 10 of our subgroups, we got a B. In math, we reached out of those four subgroups. You'll see where it says, um, State, the state goal, we met it for black, non-Hispanic, and we met it for uh, economically disadvantaged. So we got our 100 points there just because we met the state goal. The that, other, I'm sorry to interrupt, but two years ago that was an F yes. to a B. Yes. So we, we made great gains. So they take all 10 of those subgroups, they average them out individually, then they culminate it all for one grade, and the culminated grade is B. So uh, two of those subgroups met their uh, goal just by meeting their, met their 100 points just by meeting their goal. And then the second way to gain points is if you don't meet your goal, but you do make significant growth, they measure the percentage of growth that you made from last year's mission. And that's where the 46.9 and the 60. So um, I don't want to confuse you. That is not performance. That's gap closing. So briefly, I wanted to share with you, we are still in the process of finalizing all of our goals for next year, but some of the things that we are going to focus on with instruction to continue this work that we're doing because we are starting to see some progress and some gains. Um, all of that work, things don't happen overnight, but I'm just really pleased with some of the, the things that we've seen during this past year with the changes that we made. So one of the things we're going to do a little bit differently this year a principal's job is really hard because they really work in isolation in their building if you think about it. But we want to try to provide them with some more support. So our department is meeting with each of the principals on a monthly basis and we're reviewing their student data and we're doing building walkthroughs with them through the classrooms so we can see what are we doing that's working well and what are some areas that we need to talk about. Perhaps we'll identify some things that we need some further professional development on, for example. So we're going to provide the principals some more leadership in their buildings. Um, K-3 literacy, we looked at our K-3 literacy data during the past years and we realized that we really need to work to make sure that those students in the primary grades are very good readers when they leave third grade and they move into fourth grade, fifth grade, etc. So we are having all of our K-3 teachers participate in K-3 literacy professional development this year, starting this week on Professional Development Day on the 14th, they're getting a whole day of science behind reading. We have an ESC literacy consultant coming in to work with us. They'll have a whole day in November on phonological awareness and in January on phonics. And the principals are attending those sessions right alongside with their teachers. And our goal is to make sure that every student, every day, is reading, thinking, talking, and writing. So they're reading, they're thinking about what they're reading, because we need to make sure that they're uh, practicing some higher order thinking skills, and they're talking about it. So they're using their oral language speaking skills, and they're writing about it every day. We are continuing with our writing across the curriculum professional development that I mentioned earlier, and with our writing prompts. We're also working on, the state has a rubric that they use on the air test to grade the student writing. And it's very hard for students to understand because it's written in education language. So we had proposed to the state, do you have something coming out that's in more of a teacher and student friendly language 
They said, no, but that is a great idea. Would you work on that? So our district is working with ESC consultants to rewrite those rubrics to make them more friendly for teachers and students. So we're happy to be a part of that work and very honored that they asked us to do that. Uh, reading across the curriculum we talked about. Standards-based instruction, we are continuing to make, to make sure that teachers are using those pacing guides and they are following the standards and principals are working with their teachers on that through their walkthroughs, through their teacher-based team meetings, and through their building-wide instructional meetings. We have, for several years, been using the Marzano instructional strategies, which are research-based instructional strategies, and every year we have trained our teachers, and this year we're at down to our last three instructional strategies that we're sharing, and then we expect to see those used in the classroom. And, as always, we're always looking at that data. When it comes back at the end of the year, that's one piece of data. But with the eliminate uh, benchmark assessments, and also teachers are encouraged to do more formative assessments, which is what you might think of as a quiz. So if my student has to show mastery of standard on fractions, I'm going to give them a few formative assessments along the way to see where they are and what reteaching they need, so that then when they take that benchmark assessment, they can demonstrate those skills. So we're focusing a lot of classroom data and not just the big picture state data. And so that is the year in review. We're really looking forward to what's going to happen this year if we follow up on some of this. And I appreciate you taking the time to listen to our updates. Thank you for the hard work that your department's doing. Um, we put in a lot of work on that department. Same job. We have a long way.